you know, if everybody got a welcome home like this, I think we'd have a lot more history books written in the world. I am unbelievably happy to see you all and um, so very thrilled to be here on my mama's birthday. So thank you all so much for this um, invitation and this chance to talk about some things that have really puzzled me for a long time about the history of this part of the world. I'm going to share with you a passage I read quite a long time ago, and it took me a long time to figure out what was going on in this. In the winter of 1826, a noted hunter named Davy Crockett was working with his dogs and his hunting partner in the rough terrain out in West Tennessee. They were out on a winter hunting trip gathering meat and pelts. As he explained in his autobiography that he wrote in the 1830s, he was worried as he raced through the night after the dogs and the bear, not about catching the bear, which would be my concern, but about breaking his gun as he fell into the earthquake cracks all around them. Eventually, the bear he was chasing got uh, cornered by the dogs, couldn't find a way to get away, and wedged himself down into one of these earthquake cracks where the dogs could only harry it from one side where the, dog could get at, the bear could get at him. So Davy Crockett crawled into the other side and came around behind the bear with his knife and got it in the shoulder and then in the bottom and, and, and killed the bear. The next morning, after his hunting partner caught up with them and they were hauling the carcass out of the crack and dismembering it, salting it, collecting the fur, his hunting partner checked this out and said that he would not have gone into that crack for all the bears in the woods. Sure enough, Crockett wrote, later that night, a most terrible earthquake shook the earth so that we were rocked about like we'd been in a cradle. We were very much alarmed, he explained, for though we were accustomed to feel earthquakes, we were now right in the region which had been torn to pieces by them in 1812, and we thought it might take a notion and swallow us up like the big fish did Jonah. Now, what's really interesting to me as a historian of the 19th century is that I had no idea what he was talking about. But writing in 1830s, in the 1830s, 1834, Davy Crockett knew that everybody reading his book would understand about the earthquakes just like they would about the biblical reference. He didn't need to explain about Jonah and the whale, and he didn't need to explain about Mississippi Valley earthquakes. Those were both very well known. So my question is, how come we don't know about earthquakes today, right? How come this terrain that is familiar to everybody here is not regarded as earthquake territory, although we know for sure that in the past it has been? So I want to talk a little bit about how we can come to understand this hunting story of bears in the woods. Right? Why is it that an event that could be commonly understood 200 years ago could be forgotten for so long? So I'm going to talk about three different parts. One is, what happened? What was he talking about? Why did that matter? Who knew about it? What was going on then? Why have those earthquakes been forgotten? Why is that such surprising news? Why is this one of the few places in the world where the person introducing a topic on this would actually say the name of that town right? Really? Why would that be? People say, oh, Spain. You're doing this. I say, well, no, actually, I'm not working on Spain. And then I'm going to end with a few reflections on a topic I think of quite pressing interest to most of us here, which is why do those earthquakes matter today? Oh, and I want to tell you also that this slide may not look very visually impressive because it's a little blurry, but this is evidence of the best single use of research funding in my entire professional career, which was buying a tank of gas for the Piper aircraft that a friend of mine was co-owner of. Right when I was first exploring this project, I said, you know, I need to get a sense of, quite literally, the lay of the land. And he took me up. So um, I'm sure you have seen better aerial photographs of the Mississippi Valley, but never any that were quite so much as a personal hoot for me. <laughs> so first, what happened? Why do these quakes matter in 1811-12? What was going on with them? Right? What are these things that Davy Crockett and others of the early 19th century were writing about and talking about? Again, it's such a pleasure to be in a part of the world where I actually probably didn't need to put this map up, but just in case anyone has wandered in from North Dakota, I'd like to indicate for you where the Middle Mississippi Valley is and where the earthquake centers were in 1811, 1812. 
Um, I made this map a long time ago when I was trying to first figure out how to present this kind of material. And um, my kids were so little that there was a great deal of household disappointment that their mother was not, in fact, writing a history of pirates. <laughs> but the, that piratical X indicates um, roughly the area of the epicenters. And the nice thing about this map, although it was not created for this purpose, is that the colored lines actually do a pretty good job of indicating where the earthquakes were felt and where we have reports of them from. So all up and down the, the American East Coast, up into Upper Canada, up north of the Great Lakes, and indeed out along the, Missis the, sorry, the, up the Mississippi and along the Missouri River. So these are quakes that are highly localized in all kinds of ways, but that were felt across much of eastern North America and indeed much of its western portions as well. The effects of the quakes were most intense in the boot heel of Missouri, there, and you can see New Madrid is the very small town just at the top of that, in New Madrid County in the boot heel. On a cold night in December, 1811, People in the French American settlements along the Mississippi River awoke to a huge roaring. They saw flashing lights. They saw um, lightning in the sky, many of them. They smelled bad smells. They saw the horizon darken as if um, with, uh, with burning flame, and they felt the earth shake. They saw forests around them start to snap mid trunk as the earth waved underneath the trees and huge crevices opened up around them, um, out of which poured water, and uh, often really warm water, and foul smells threatening to drown people and livestock. So one of the really fun things I've been able to do in the course of working on this project is to present this kind of stuff to some school groups. And I often, I've shown this to a group of middle schoolers and say, OK, this is from about 200 years ago. Do you think this makes sense? Do you think this is an accurate historical representation? And of course, they would say, no, that looks very, you know, romanticized and overdone, and of course it is overdone, but in fact this picture is a quite accurate representation, as I take the middle schoolers through, of what people reported at the time. Every one of those aspects of the trees snapping and houses collapsing and lightning in the sky and crevices, all of that is, that what, is what people saw. Now we today wouldn't see lightning as associated with earthquakes, we probably think that was happenstantial and there are other reasons that earthquake lights flash, but what's interesting is that this is a pretty good document of how people were describing this event in words. One of the most in, um, interesting and dramatic effects of these earthquakes were what called sand blows, and that is when there's um, a clay under, uh, the, the soil underneath the clay underlayer of the Mississippi Valley gets shaken by intense pressure and punches its way up, making a spout that collapses in a kind of um, volcano-looking shower of white sand. At the time, these made great conical, volcano-shaped um, protuberances. Um, this is 200 years later. You can see them in the right time of growing season as white patches on soybean and cotton fields around the epicentral regions. We tend to think of earthquakes as being an event of, you know, the earth. But in fact, in the early 19th century, especially when waterways were the crucial way that most people got around, they were a very large um, event for waterways, and they impacted the Mississippi River in particular. So this is, again, an illustration from later, but accurate to what people at the time were describing, of what the Mississippi River was doing. So one river traveler wrote a letter that got quoted a lot in many newspapers at the time, explaining his, his experiences being on a Mississippi River flatboat. He wrote, during the day, there was with very little intermission a continued series of shocks attended with innumerable explosions like the rolling of thunder. The bed of the river was incessantly disturbed and the water boiled severely in every part. One of the spouts we had seen rising, if it had come under the boat, would inevitably have sunk it and probably have blown it into a thousand fragments. Our ears were constantly assaulted with the crashing of timber. The banks were instantaneously crashing down and fell with all their growth into the water. He was describing what many people on the Mississippi River talked of as a booming flood. That is, in periods of very rapid high water, large stretches of riverbank could get undermined and simultaneously collapse into the river, 
creating an enormous loud noise of the booming flood and also then setting up further waves that would slosh back and forth in this Mississippi River, which before the Corps of Engineers got a hold of it was much wider, more meandering, um, and more shallow than it is to portion of, portions of it are today. So it was a really wide body of water in many places. Note, too, that some of that destruction on the river was very similar in kind to what could happen during a spring flood, right, during an ordinary flood, just more intense and more concentrated in time. And that similarity of these earthquake effects to other kinds of natural events is part of why these earthquakes could later be denied and forgotten. Who can tell whether a riverbank collapsed in a flood that was normal or because it had been shaken by an earthquake? During the earthquakes, the river did indeed, uh, a portion of the river got uplifted and a portion of the Mississippi River, the Mississippi River did indeed flow briefly but very dramatically backwards. The quakes created lakes like this earthquake lake noted on an early 19th century map. If any of y'all have been to this part of the world, you know there's no lake there now, but there was for a few years after these earthquakes. If you stand on the observation deck at New Madrid, Missouri, you are standing on top of and looking out over on the river, the former site of the town of New Madrid, which got moved back because of the, the riverbank ate out that swoop in its, cur uh, that curve in its course. Again, as it had been doing in a seasonal basis and would continue to do, but did more dramatically because of these earthquakes. The earthquake dammed a small creek, Real Foot Creek, creating Real Foot Lake. This is it imagined by an Arkansas, actually an Arkansas geologist, or a geologist who worked also on Arkansas. So in the distance, you can see the dead uh, cypress standing up. And here it is about 10 years ago. The quakes all changed topography in the regions around them, creating what's known as the sunk lands. Right? This is an image of them from about 100 years after. I keep saying the quakes. Part of what was so powerful about these disturbances is that they came in sequence. Three, maybe four, depending on who's counting, very large quakes. We can talk later about what very large means, because that's one of the many aspects that gets debated about these, disturb these seismic disturbances, plus thousands, literally thousands of quakes in between them and continuing. So up and through the 1820s and 30s, if you wanted to ride a horse or a mule and you were a traveler and you wanted to travel around these regions that we think of as the epicenters, you would do best to hire a local mount because horses from far away would be too disturbed by the continuing tremors. Animals that had been born and reared in the Mississippi, in, in that part of the world, were undisturbed by the continuing tremors. A kind of party trick in that part of the world up through the 1840s was to take a stranger over to a fence post and have him put their hand on the post. Because you could often feel a slight tremor in that post that bipedal bodies don't sense as well. So if that's what happened, what difference did it make? What'd that do? As people tell me, okay, so a tree falls in a swamp, nobody's there to hear it. What difference does that make? I spent a long time researching to find out some of that answer. And this illustration tells us part of why. This is one of the only illustrations I've found of native people living in the swamps of East Arkansas and Southeast Missouri in the 19th century. It's very interesting because it puts them there after the Civil War when few were left at that time. But this is accurate about who was living there before the quakes hit. What I found, and this was really cool historical work, this is like the kind of stuff that makes historians get up in the morning, I found stuff in the basement of an archive that was lost and it was old scratchy pieces of paper that made a new story. I found records of Cherokees and other Native Americans from the eastern United States moving into that region in the late 19th century, excuse me, late 18th century and the early 19th century, I found records of massive Indian trade in that area. This was, northeast Arkansas was a booming site of settlement, of trade, of diplomacy from about the 1780s and 90s up through the 1800s. After this earthquake, people voted with their feet and they left. So the history that gets written is, well, nobody was living there. It was just a swamp. It was really deserted and messed up, and you couldn't really travel very freely around it. That's right. 
That was true after 1812. That was not true for the 30 years before. The St. Francis River was a major conduit, not just a backwater. The Quakes were part of Indian movements throughout much of the eastern United States. They were a part of the advocacy of Tecumseh and Tenskwatawa, the Shawnee brothers whose movement of spiritual, cultural, and military resistance to the United States is a big part of American and Indian relations in the early 19th century. And the spiritual force of these Quakes was felt by many people in many communities all around North America. Now, anytime a historian shows you a photograph of an image of a time pre-photography, you are right to get suspicious. I couldn't find any really good images of early 19th century camp meetings. So I'm using this shot of, if anybody ever driven on, I think this is Highway 40, somewhere between here and Boston, you will pass by this symbol of the importance of spiritual life in our present environmental world. Many people took the quakes as a sign to repent and return to the Lord or to the Great Spirit. Indian Americans, Indians and black Americans and white Americans engaged in powerful movements of spiritual renewal. That may not sound very, sound very surprising, but as a historian of medicine, I was very interested in part of why. People felt the jolts of an earthquake in this very time of very physical religion, much in the same way that they felt the jolts of the Holy Spirit. So people experienced seismic tremors and interpreted those very clearly as, as messages from God, that the physicality and the experience of these quakes was important in these movements of, of revival that are a big part of our social history of this era. If I talk to you about the Middle Mississippi Valley, I do not think, unless y'all are really, really well read, that Cherokee settlement or fur trade is what will leap immediately to mind. Right? Certainly not for me. These earthquakes have vanished largely from our popular tellings and certainly from our historical record. I have to explain to my historical buddies what I'm working on, right? They haven't the foggiest idea. They've never heard of this, right? Why? Why is that the case? I think there are reasons that are social. I think there are reasons that are environmental. And there are reasons that are scientific why we have so profoundly forgotten these earthquakes. I'm going to talk, about, talk with you about them very quickly. The first has to do with that enormous breakpoint of memory in the late 19th century, the Civil War. Many of you all will know that a major US federal campaign for control of the Mississippi River took place at island number 10, just below New Madrid, Missouri. In a daring nighttime raid, so that the Confederates held the island with floating batteries all around it. Nobody could go up or down because they'd be sitting ducks for that loop of the river. In a daring nighttime raid, Union commanders uh, put hay all over their, um, all their steamboats to disguise it, burned the, 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 the coal real slowly so it wouldn't fake much smoke, and dropped down below the wet rebel batteries under cover of a dramatic, of a thunderstorm. And then the next night, a couple more did the same thing. Meanwhile, very unpleasant and mosquito, unhappy and mosquito-bitten Union troops, plus people who'd freed themselves from slavery, the so-called contrabands, were digging a space across that little bend there for Union supplies to get below the fort, right? And supplies and men, digging a path through the swamps. That's a story that's well known, at least for people who've studied the Civil War. I know it, right? It's exciting stuff. This battle for island number 10 is part of our Civil War history. But what's not known ever anywhere is that the reason that Island Number 10 was such a great place to have a fort if you were a Confederate is that its back door was, connect, was protected by swamps, nobody could get at you, and that those were earthquake swamps. The swamp land that the Federals had to, to saw through were earthquake terrain. This is seismic country that created the whole possibility for the Battle of Island Number 10, but that dropped out of the history. What we remember is the battle. And I'm showing you this absolutely fabulous map from 1900, far too briefly to really read it. There's a lot here. I will say it's in the book, but I know I'm gonna go on way too fast for those of y'all who like maps and for which I apologize. After the Civil War, people understood this part of the world not as a region of French and Indian and American interaction, but as a zone of racial intimidation. Northeast Arkansas was a center in the late 19th century for anti-black violence and racial terrorism. And that's how our histories got written. Right? That's what people remembered of this region. If there are oral histories of this region, it's about that, not about longer ago earthquakes. 
New people moved into the region, people with no experience of these quakes. So the regions of southeast Missouri, northeast Arkansas, and the areas around them right, became a place of cotton culture, and tim you know, white families, black families came into timber and to farm. Most Americans came to know the region right around the epicenters in the early 20th century, not because of any kind of seismic history, but because of a really fascinating multiracial or union organizing effort from the Southern Tenant Farmers Working, Farm Workers Union. Their roadside demonstration about being thrown off the land and not getting subsidies through the, the programs of the New Deal, they set up camp along the public roadsides where they had legal right to occupy for three days in order to draw attention to their plight as landless and dispossessed and quite literally starving people. Newspaper photographers from around the country came and took pictures of an earthquake region because of these arguments about economic and racial injustice, not because of other kinds of history. So for social reasons, an, an environmental history of, of seismic events dropped out of our popular history and our, our understanding of this region's history. For environmental region, reasons, too, and the environment matters, and we pay attention to the environment, we often see things that we can't see otherwise. I was trying to make this case to a fairly restless full, car full of people two summers ago. Now, if you notice this slide, the front part of it is ever so slightly blurry, as if an otherwise infinitely kind and patient spouse were not quite willing to have the car completely come to a stop. <laughs> lest a partner jump out and do more historical walking around. If there was a sound effect for this slide, it would be the entire back of the car going, no, don't make us stop again for more history. In the late 19th and early 20th century, the regions where the quakes had hit became a place of timber culture. Okay, the timber railroads, particularly in southeast Missouri, to a lesser extent in Arkansas, uh, private enterprise put in an entire network of railroads to harvest the old growth timber, and I do mean the old growth timber, right, that we have now forgotten about those regions. Changing the face of the landscape, changing drain drainage patterns, changing the vegetation. Mills changed the whole face of the landscape, and so did one of the most impressive and astounding and large-scale engineering projects of the early 20th century world, not the Panama Canal, although the engineers came there from there, but the Little River, Little River Drainage District and the associated smaller scale drainage projects, the patchwork of them that happened in Arkansas, with which an entire dense forest of sunk land was drained and regularized through human labor, through steam power, right? very wide scale environmental change, right? And through explosions. Who says history is not fun? This made a swampland into high, highly fertile cotton country, creating in the tangled vines and downed trees of a seismic zone instead a regularized geometry still visible today, right? cutting a new set of parameters and boundaries on the land. So for environmental reasons, earthquakes that happen in a bottomland, earthquakes that happen on soft soil, are not visible in the way that, you know, if you fly a plane over the San Andreas Fault, there are places on a clear day where you can see the rocks offset, right? You can go to sidewalks where they're offset. You, you can't do that here, right? The vegetation has been changed, things grow over, soil shifts. So there are social and military reasons for this forgetting. There are environmental reasons, and there are also scientific reasons. Behold a primary source. This is a signal of one of the most interesting moments in the history of the study of earth science. And that is the moment, right around 1890, when in peer-reviewed published work, somebody took two machines for measuring seismic movement, we now call them seismographs, in two different places and showed that they both showed disturbance at the same moment and that that correlated with an earthquake that had been documented in Japan. Eureka! 
Now you could use machines in a box in parts of you know, Potsdam and Wilhelmshaven in Germany, in the German states, and you could see what was happening around the globe. The development of self-registering seismic instrumentation transformed seismology. All of a sudden, you could be anywhere on the Earth and be understanding information about pla other places in the Earth. Seismology became a modern science with this in introduction of seismic instrumentation and with the introduction of exact numerical records. Pretty soon, by the early 20th century, to be a seismologist meant to study instruments, to take instrumental readings, and to compare them. So this is a picture, not as a friend of mine says about early and unsuccessful DJs, but this is a history, is, is an image of the height of scientific cool. This is a set of Jesuits at St. Louis University in the late 1920s tending seismographs. Right, taking care of the instruments that told us stories about the history of the Earth's movement. No more was the human body any kind of register about what was going on. One geologist, 100 years after the quakes, understood that they had happened and collected evidence about them. Here's a piece of his evidence. By the later 19th, sorry, by the later 20th century, this piece of evidence would be much less legible than it is to much of us today. And I have to tell you, I looked at this a long time before getting what I was seeing. So first, what you see in this image, taken in 1912, is what for most people in most parts of the world would be a very slight difference in elevation. That's only significant if you understand that it is in a floodplain. That's a fault scarp, right? That is evidence of movement of the earth. But there's another, so he's documenting evidence of really quite powerful seismic forces in that seemingly, I mean, you know, I could go on a hike in Massachusetts woods where I live and never notice that, right? I'd be too busy tripping over boulders of granite. Right? This is significant seismic evidence. But there's another piece of this image that's significant. And not only did most Americans lose the ability to recognize it, but even most Earth scientists did, as the Earth sciences became more numerical, more quantitative, more computer-driven, more mathematical. When Myron Fuller, this geologist, was publishing this in 1912, almost every expert who looked at it would immediately get what that told him. He took this 100 years after the New Madrid earthquakes. How old's that tree? That's way older than 100 years old. Yeah. I once gave a talk about this, some preliminary findings of the Smithsonian Institution, and one of the trustees came rushing after me and said, I own timber in that part of the world. That's an old tree. And I said, that's right. And you're unusual because you see that. Most of us have never seen a tree anywhere near that old. We have no idea what a really old tree looks like because we have cut them all down. Right? So what, he's, what Myron Fuller was documenting and what recent scientists have documented is that the New Madrid quakes of 1811 and 1812 are only the most recent series of quakes to hit the Mississippi Valley. And this man on a horse showing the scale of that tree was part of that early evidence. But even that evidence became less legible to experts and non-experts alike in that intervening hundred years. Sandy spots in a cotton field in a part of the world that most people didn't pay attention to. What kind of evidence is that? Isn't that the floods you people have all the time? Don't those leave sandy spots by the sides of rivers? You know, isn't that just some kind of drainage problem? That's not earthquake evidence. Again, this is from Myron Fuller's own evidence. So the kind of evidence matters. So too do the form in which that evidence is presented. I started with Davy Crockett. We're going to conclude with Davy Crockett because he's part of the problem. This is an illustration from Davy Crockett's autobiography. People of the 19th century made his autobiography a bestseller. Really interested in what he had to say, his adventure stories of hunting bears in the woods. Never mind that he was actually quite a noted politician, right, who did actually quite sophisticated political work up in D.C. But he told stories about bears in the woods and people want to read them. They are, in fact, great stories. No self-respecting seismologist of the middle 20th century is going to pick up that book and read it for its earthquake evidence. Especially because 
Most people, when I talk about Davy Crockett, will look at me and say, oh, was he real? Did he really exist? Right, so the mid 20th century TV show and then the movies made from that did exactly the same thing that his autobiography did for people of the 19th century, make him completely implausible as a source of reality on anything, right? And I'm betting right now, I would bet you a dollar that every person, I would say my age and older in this room is right now mentally humming Davy, Davy Crockett, King of the Wild Frontier. Yeah, these things matter. I mean, popular culture shapes the way we look at the world, right? He is not the person I would look to for scientific evidence. So these quakes happened. They had impact. They mattered to people, and I didn't go into this part, but they were discussed very widely at the time they were known about. They were forgotten for reasons that were scientific, for reasons that had to do with environmental transformations, and for reasons that had to do with social events and the ways in which those two shape our understandings of the history of the world. They matter now because many scientists have now demonstrated not only that this part of the world is subject to a repeated series of large earthquakes over the past many thousands of years, and that we are entering the period where we might reasonably start to expect another series, and because we don't understand them very well. Most earthquakes in the world can be described by putting your hands together like this and moving them up and down next to each other. That's how plate, tectonic plates move. Or in the really nasty ones where one goes under another, right? That's makes the big Pacific tsunamis come out of that kind of what's called subduction. We're not anywhere near the edge of a tectonic plate. We are smack in the middle of one. And so what the plate tectonic revolution told us was about the movement of tectonic plates, we don't have real good explanations for precisely what would create earthquakes of that much force with that kind of sequences and those kind of recurrences. And that matters because this is not the only part of the world in which they occur, and there are large communities of people living, for instance, in northern China uh, and other parts of the world who are subject to exactly these kinds of quakes. So they matter. But they are still hard to see. And as evidence, I want to show you this image. So when I was very first, like just starting to explore this project, I did an archival trip down in southeast Missouri, Actually, I think I may have been borrowing mom and dad's car to do this. And I was driving back across a cotton field as the sun was setting over that agricultural terrain. And if you've been in that part of the world, you know how beautiful that is. And I looked over. In the, it was in the very early spring. Things were just starting to come up. And I said, oh, there's a sand blow. Now I know what that is. And I pulled my car over and avoided getting hit by the 18-wheeler. And I grabbed my camera. And this was a long enough ago, and I'm enough of a Luddite, that I didn't even have a digital camera. And I raced to the side of the road, and I took a picture of a sand blow I was seeing. I thought, I know what I'm seeing now. And then I got my film back, and it's completely invisible. Now, some of y'all who know more about photography than I do and about slanty light will explain to me why that is, right? But I could see with my eyes a white circular depression right in the middle of that field that is nowhere evident in that photograph. Yeah because it, you know, it had to do with just how the light was hitting different colors of soil, and I didn't have a good enough camera to capture it, I suppose. I would present to you a metaphor of how we can choose or find a way to see or not see these Mississippi Valley quakes, and I would suggest to you that um, cornball t-shirts are sometimes true. It matters because this is indeed our fault. Thank you all so much. Okay, we've got time for a few questions. If you raise your hand, we'll get the microphone. Mr. Worthen, right here. Here's your historian right there. Uh, kind of very, we've forgotten a lot about that, but a few years ago we were warned that it was going to happen again, and everybody got all hot and bothered about it. I was just wondering, uh, when is it going to happen again? <laughs> Oh, I can tell you so very much about the past, and I wish I could tell you more about the future. I'm so glad you asked that question because, indeed, part of the story of why we've forgotten them also has to do with the whole Ibn Browning fiasco in 1990, where there was a false prediction of, it's going to happen exactly now, and the incredible frustration of people in the earth sciences and of geologists 
at having people say, is it going to happen right now? Like, um, we want to give you, you know, an accurate and scientifically informed assessment, which is we think it likely that this will happen, and we can give you estimates of its probability, but no, no credible expert is ever going to tell you a day. Right? And that, that was a real frustrating message to have to get across. So that whole, um, I was really quite good, I thought, about sticking to a short time period. I did not bring that in. But yes, that's, a, that's also a huge part of this story. And um, the 50, they now give like a 50-year forecast right, that is more probable than not. So, so look up, uh, an excellent source for this, by the way, is the USGS, your tax money and mine, pay for excellent public outreach. And both USGS and the Archaeological, Arkansas Geological Survey have really terrific websites that will give you a lot more scientific information. So I would really encourage you to go and look at the, both of those places. Question right here. Thanks. Some of the prominent USGS West Coast geologists are taking a sort of a revisionist look at the whole New Madrid area and saying that it's overblown. Uh, how do you react to that? What's, what is, yeah, right, let me think. Um, what's interesting there is that part of the argument is, well, they may not be as big as we once thought. So at one point, these earthquakes were estimated to be in the lower eights, like maybe an 8.2, 8.3, maybe even larger than that. And now the thought is they could be 30 times smaller than that and be in the 7.0s, 7.2s. Still big. Also, West Coast geologists are used to looking at earthquakes that shake harder rock. They're not used to, I mean, I think in general, the earth scientist community is, and disaster planners and all of us generally, are less adept at understanding the effects of earthquakes that hit regions that, in this very alarming phrase that kept coming up when I ask experts about this, the Mississippi Valley shakes like a bowl full of jelly, right? So that if you were in an area where nobody has hot water heaters bolted down, nobody has a disaster plan, and schools are not seismically retrofit, then an earthquake that is really quite moderate by world standards can cause much more damage. And actually, the earthquake, recent earthquakes in Chile and Haiti, which were very, very similar magnitudes and caused utterly dissimilar societal impacts, are unfortunately and tragically a real proof of that. So I would say, you people duke it out and tell me where you want to go on the magnitude, fine, but my concern is with how this is going to affect people in the present day, and for that, some kind of preparation is important. And what I learned in the course of this is that many aspects of disaster preparation, particularly for earthquakes, are really not rocket science. Like, if you bolt your water heaters down, wow, that really makes a difference, right? And having disaster plans, having extra water around, I mean, there are a series of steps that are implementable at the level of every family or every small town that are doable and don't cost a lot of money and that makes sense to look at, I would argue. Question right here. Not too long ago, uh, there were some enhanced building codes uh, for uh, Northeast Arkansas to deal with uh, earthquake preparedness. That didn't happen. And then a steel mill got put up there. It, there could be a relationship between those two. Uh, what do you think of the uh, viability of a steel plant on an earthquake zone? Am I standing in the doorway? <laughs> <laughs> or am I in the middle of a very large structure built with unreinforced masonry? Um, I have a really healthy respect for seismic building codes, um, partly because I did live for a while in California, and I've walked out of buildings alive um, that in an area without seismic building codes probably would have crushed me. I was in the Loma Prieta quake in 1989, um, and that was an exciting event in my life, and it did not, I'm very pleased to say, end my life, right? And, and California building codes are one aspect of that, and we saw that in Chile as well. Um, you know, there are people better positioned than I to talk precisely about the seismic risk, and certainly engineers, who again, would have much more information than I do about exactly what kind of engineering constraints do make sense for a region with what kind of seismic risk. Um, one of the things that I have been struck by is that the conversations about this have been political, right? And, and I mean, of course, we all live in a political world, um, but I'm very interested in scientific evidence. And my position is that I listen very carefully to what scientists tell me about their field when they're working hard in it. And, you know, if... 
That's what I would tell my city councilor if they were discussing seismic yes, sir, codes. Yes, right here in the second row. Yes, it's coming right at you. This is not a question, but a point of observation for your research. I'm from this area. My grandmother grew up, was born in New Madrid, Missouri, and I had the father, uh, the father of a friend that I had at that time. His great great grandfather actually saw the Mississippi River run backwards <gasps> and fill up Real Foot Lake as a child, wow. 1811. Well, and if wow. you've got, if you got any primary source research material, she yeah. wants it. Yeah. If you got any papers on that, yeah. she wants and, it. And the thing is, I can help her in a lot of ways. Good. <laughs> Do Dr. Ernst, go ahead. Um, can I just say briefly while we're passing the microphone that if, especially if any of y'all are school teachers or interested in this, there is a website for the Center at the Center for Earthquake Research and Information, which is a joint project of University of Memphis and USGS, and they have a whole. Um, database of first-person accounts so um, you don't have to believe what I say you can go read what people wrote but it's also a fabulous resource for any kind of school project or people who want to know about the impact of the time that was a great segue to an observation and a question I, I grew up in Greene County uh, in the suburb of Walcott called Laredo and passed down from my mother on down was the myth that Crowley's Ridge was created by these earthquakes I know it was a myth uh, but that was part of our family folklore probably for almost 100 years. Uh, the second thing I want to say is that of a teacher. I can only imagine that the teachers at the University of Massachusetts or Boston are lucky to have you. And what I'd like to observe is that you've demonstrated perfectly what we ought to be doing more of. And that is finding the relationships between ways of knowing and understanding our world. History, science, uh, the, the variety of things that obviously you bring in that. So thank you for that. And welcome. Thank you. Thank yes, sir. Okay, a question right here in the front row. And, what? and Crow actually, the geological history of Crowley's Ridge is a part of this story, that there is some argument that prior seismic activity, much before 1811 and 1812, may have something to do with the Crowley's Ridge formation. So actually, that's, that's, that's actually an open research question. A oh, very short question. You, you opened by saying in 1826, Davy Crockett hunted a bar. And then that evening, or near, near that evening, there was a violent earthquake. It sounded like about a four or five. That was 14 years afterwards. Are you, how long did the movement, uh, how long was the period of movement? That seems like a rather late aftershock. Um, the tremors that alarmed people continued um, up in many parts of the world up until the 1850s. Yeah, and, but, I mean, they, we still have tremors in that area. Yes, sir. Right? I mean, it's not, it hasn't stopped. Right here. Thank you. Do any of the pieces of paper that you have found that were written by Native Americans or others who were living in Arkansas at the time, can they, by comparison to people who were living, say, in southern Illinois, be used as a means of determining which way the majority of the energy went? As a person who lives west of the fault and roughly southeast, I'd be particularly interested in knowing how scared I should be. Um, the standard scientific story, which I pay a lot of attention to, is that seismic waves transmit much better on the eastern half of North America than on the west. And that is, that is de demonstrated to be the case. I mean, we know that that is the case. That's, for instance, why that, um, that relatively small quake in Mineral Springs, Virginia, right, wrecked the Washington Monument. Right? Is it that transmits really well. Now, part of the evidence for the New Madrid earthquakes is that, well, people felt it in the, in the east and not in the west of, the United, of, of, the, of North America. Right? Well, not coincidentally, most of us who've been studying this read primarily or only English and read only people who were writing down English. Right? Um, there is evidence, and I don't have as much of it as I would like, right? but I have evidence from a scientist accompanying a U.S. scientific exploring expedition along the Missouri River that Indians living along the upper Missouri were discussing these tremors and trying to find out reasons for them and finding more information about them. Right? So they were felt along the upper Missouri. Right? And that's not been part of our scientific story. So I think the, the basic idea is you worry more in the East, but I think the, the complication that I throw in as a historian is you know, 
ooh, there are actually more, more records than we think there are, and they're by more people than we're used to looking at, and they tell us a more complicated and, I think, a more interesting story. Uh, you know, there are folks here from, you, from, the, from Arkansas Geological Survey. Talk to them. Other questions? Yeah. Okay, here you go. I'd like to know if you have any information or opinions about the fracking that has been going on in Arkansas. <gasps> I would like to turn that around, because actually I'm really interested in learning more about that as a kind of next project. Um, because, um, as you all know, probably, Arkansas is the site of a very interesting set of conversations in which there's been um, this earthquake swarms, right, in north central Arkansas near Green Bar, near Guy, that um, we're the first place that has really positively correlated any kind of change in earthquake, uh, you know, very, very low level seismic activity um, with, the, with the turning on or off of the injection wells for the disposal of fracking waste. Now, what's interesting, that's, that's demonstrated, that's why there's been all this movement in the legislature about regulating fracking, right, and debates about that. What's very interesting to me is that many fracking advocates are now saying, could those earthquakes in this part of Arkansas trigger a big one? Right? And right now, the answer of seismologists is no. No, they couldn't. They're just not connected enough. There's not enough power. No, that's not going to happen. What I find as a historian very, very interesting, and you'll notice that people like me always say, well, as a historian, because I'm trying to get out of like trying to say what's happening in the present day, right? But that's, that's where I can come from, is telling you about the past. As a historian, I find it very interesting that many of the contemporary fracking advocates, many of, some of whom may be in the room, are then coming back to say, well, look, you all were wrong about it causing low-level earthquakes. How can we trust you about the connection with larger earthquakes? Right? And that's very interesting. I mean, I think that's, a, it's an open question, about, it's an open challenge, right? And I, I have not seen any evidence that very, very large seismicity has ever been connected with the kind of mining activity that we're talking about. Um, but I think that, if I, that, that the challenge that many ordinary people are placing to our scientific establishment is, how do we know what's what? Right? If a lot about fracking has, has been discredited, you know, some of the research is being discredited, how do we know what we should trust you on? And I think that's, you know, a, a very powerful democratic, little d, like a democratic society move to say, we want to know why, right? We want to know about the content of our science and that, that we, we, we have the right to ask that. And I think those questions are important. Let's, uh, let's thank Condoveri for being here today. Thank Great you. program. Great program.